Welcome to the WWE Podcast. The most passionate and authentic wrestling analysis on the web. We've got you covered with every Raw, SmackDown, and NXT show. Giving you a no bullshit opinion. We know you love wrestling. We do too. So let's get this show underway. And that's the bottom line. What? Because Stone Cold said so. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this week's Highs and Lows in Wrestling. I am your host, Mimi Burris, and this week was a phenomenal week um, in wrestling all around. So I'm excited to talk about it, and let's jump right in. Like I said, um, awesome week in wrestling. We had uh, New Year's Bash on AEW. We had um, New Year's Evil on NXT. SmackDown was a pretty good show overall. Raw was crap. Um, So your pretty usual week in wrestling. Um... You know, speaking of which, I guess I want to jump right into uh, jump right into this week's low. Speaking of crap, and um, you know, briefly touch on Raw. I, just a couple honorable mentions. The entire damn show. Uh, yeah, that was that was not good at all. I mean, not to mention, I, I we all should have known when we saw the the H phone. I don't I don't even know what that gimmick was, but how Raw started off with that thing, the H phone. And, you know, you can tweet, you can use Facebook, you can use what like cool. You know, my iPhone does that. Uh, I, I didn't get it. Maybe I was missing some inside jokes. So if somebody can actually explain this to me, I would love that. Um, so yeah, there was that. And there were a million other things on Raw that, that were terrible, but I will not get into that. Um, in fact, you can actually go tune into Matt's uh, Raw review that dropped on Tuesday night, Wednesday morning-ish. Um, to hear about that, uh, I agree with about 99% of his opinions. And uh, yeah, it was a terrible show. But um. Other honorable mention was actually on SmackDown for, for the low for this week. Kind of funny, you know, there was that great, th- not great, there was that okay tag team match between um, the Dirty Dogs, Dolph Ziggler and Robert Roode and uh, the Street Profits. And I'm I'm an advocate for the Street Profits. I actually don't mind them. I think they're, they're pretty entertaining. You know, they have their faults, but I think they've got a lot of personality and charisma and, and I think... I think with fans, they do a lot better. I think they're more of a fan-oriented team, which was, was something I said on the weekend review that I did um, last weekend with Matt. But uh, the match between these two, like I said, was okay to decent, maybe. But the one thing that I, I couldn't get over and totally took me out of this match, and, and I'm curious if anybody else noticed this, was, you know, the whole story of the match was Montez Ford and the leg. You know, he was selling his leg. That his leg was injured from last week, that he couldn't do moves, that, you know, he did that, like, very Eddie Guerrero, you know, previously or more recently, that ricochet drop to the ground. It was almost, it was like, it was too much outside the ring. I get it, and I get what they were trying to do there, but again, it's almost like you could overact, and I think it's actually pretty hard to overact in WWE, but I, I thought it was overacting. And, um, and then throughout the match, you know, he, y- you can't sell part of the time and then do super kicks and, you know, lift men up above your head. Like, Dolph Ziggler and Robert Roode are not the biggest guys on the roster, sure, but they're still big dudes, and if your leg is that severely injured where you're, like, falling down on the ground like that, you're not going to be able to lift someone up over your head like that and be perfectly fine or do a super kick, but then all of a sudden when, you know, there's downtime and you're climbing up on the top rope, you know, that's when your leg hurts totally takes me out of the moment you know I was not a fan of that um and then and then there was that part where I think he had hit a super kick on I forget who it was Dolph Ziggler or or Rude and um and then he fell down for the cover you know they kicked out and then he's going to make a tag to Montez or excuse me he's going to make a tag to um Angelo Dawkins and he's like crawling and crawling and crawling and I'm like dude you just did a super kick you didn't even get hit I understand like there's been this grueling match or whatever but like Again, it was just like this overacting, and if you're going to sell something, and you're going to sell it that badly, you got to sell it the entire time. And, like, what are you losing doing that? It's like you're going to lose the match anyways, you know what I mean? So it just looked fake to me, took me totally out of the moment, and just a quick honorable mention. I wanted to get that out there because, you know, I wanted to hear if anybody else had noticed that. Um, uh, On a bright spot, though, quick... I guess honorable mention for the high of the week, not really a high at all, but it's just something I saw in the match that I did really like was the referee's count. Um, I don't know her name, my apologies, but um, 
the count in that match was so nice and slow and steady and like an actual three seconds. And you don't see that anymore. Um, do we have to have every single kick out be at two and a half? Oh, we kicked out at two and three quarters or what? No, like, again, then it's like the same thing with the roll up. When you overuse something like that, it it makes it so it's not so special. You know, not that a roll up is special, but you guys get my point. So, yeah, I just wanted to quickly mention that and then, you know, get into really what we're talking about and my, my real low of the week, which, again, I like I said before, I think is, is probably going to be a surprise to some of you guys. But it was the Big E and Apollo Crews match for the Intercontinental title match for the Intercontinental for the Intercontinental Title Championship. I don't think I'm even going to edit that out. You guys can just listen to me botch that. Okay, Big E, Apollo Crews, Intercontinental Title Championship match on SmackDown. I got a couple bullet points on this one, so bear with me, guys. Yeah, this was my low for the week for some obvious choices or maybe some not-so-obvious things. But first of all, why was this the first match on the card? You already are putting a championship, right, that supposedly has all this prestige you're already putting it on SmackDown. Why is it kicking? It's not kicking off the show. We had that weird Roman Reigns segment beforehand. But why is it the first match on the show? I, I didn't get that. Um, next, that they, they didn't even show the entrances for either man. You know, they showed a little bit of the end of Big E's entrance, but barely. You've got two hours. You know, cut something else a little bit short. You know, I love Billy Kay, and I think Billy Kay was funny, but cut that Riot Squad Billy Kay thing out, fine. You know, you were in a... Give these two guys some respect, and the respect that they deserve, and give the championship freaking match the respect it deserves. Um, you know, you've already taken me out of the moment and told me that this match isn't important, because neither of these men had entrances. Um... I felt like Cruz, Noel sold uh, German suplex uh, from Big E, like got right back up and then ran at him. I just, again, that's a German suplex. That's supposed to be a big move, right? Brock Lesnar's whole thing is suplex city. Big E is not Brock Lesnar, but he's also not a small guy. And I understand neither is Apollo Cruz, but like, can we go back to SummerSlam, Brock Lesnar versus John Cena? And John Cena got his butt whooped by Brock Lesnar, mostly from suplexes, including German suplexes. Like, sell a damn move. Um, Mickey James actually did this interview, and I and I want to say it was with the Busted Open podcast. I'm, I'm not 100% sure, so don't quote me on that. But I think it was with the Busted Open podcast, not to give them free advertising. But she did this interview with them a couple months ago. And she and they talked to her basically about how that the wrestlers are no selling in the ring, right? And Mickey James said something, and, I, and I'm paraphrasing it because I don't remember the exact quote, but it stood out to me. She said, "You know, if the wrestlers sell fifty percent of the time, you know, the fans are only going to care fifty percent, or something along those lines." That that and it registered to me because I get it because you took me out of this moment when again you just got a German suplex, right? And you're not selling it whatsoever. Um, it might seem like a little nitpicky thing, but it means more to the whole match itself because, again, there's now twice, uh, twice in the last, maybe in the first five minutes of the match, I think, you've already taken me out of the moment, twice. So I don't I don't think this match is important and one dude's not even selling the moves from the other giant dude who's supposed to be having this big rise and supposed to look like the super strong guy. But Apollo Crews doesn't sell a German suplex and you just told me that this is a work and it isn't real. Um, because if I got that move from Big E, I know I'd be in pain. Um, or at least I'd show a little bit something. Um, next, moving down, I said, you know, I didn't have a problem with the false finish. That whole two, you know, uh, shoulder, both shoulders down, one, two, three. I think at first I was like, it's a little wonky, another excuse, WWE, no finish, whatever. But they got me because I love the interaction between Apollo Crews and Big E. Um, I think it's okay to have a face and a face have some kind of interaction like that and have a face do a somewhat heelish move or whatever. Like, I don't know. I guess I'm not so strict on those lines. And I like seeing some intensity from one, Apollo Crews. We saw a little bit more character from him. And then two, the way Biggie's eyes changed the minute Apollo Crews slapped him. I thought that was great. I thought, again, it showed intensity. And also, Biggie wasn't stupid. He wasn't just like, yeah, let's restart the match, whatever, right? Like, not like, I'm a fighting champion or whatever. He just said, no, like, we just had the match, dude. Like, I'm not going to do this again. You know, it is what it is. And then, 
only restarted the match or agreed to restart the match because Apollo Crews slapped him. I I like the logic. I like the interaction. I like that whole thing. So I like I said, I didn't I didn't mind that false finish because it led to that. Something I did mind, however, was um, Apollo Crews hit that unbelievable uh, standing moonsault he does. You know, he um, again, great athleticism. I'm not taking anything away from Apollo Crews. Um, you can clearly tell he's an indie wrestler, though, because it's high spot and high spot and high spot. Um, and like I said, there was, you know, there's a difference between registering and selling. My whole point to this is um, Apollo Crews hit that moonsault on Big E. And if you watch closely... Again, another little nitpick, but again, all this stuff adds up. Big E didn't even kick out. There was a one, two, three, and Big E didn't even kick out. You can watch his shoulders. Both of them stayed on the mat. Again, you've taken me out of the moment because I'm someone who watches. I'm a wrestling fan, right? I watch wrestling and I pay attention to the detail, and you don't. And therefore, I don't believe what you're putting in front of the TV for me. You've you've got this match had less believability than the freaking fiend being lit on fire. You know, all these little things. Um, add up and they mean something uh, to a fan who's watching and they mean something to have any kind of emotional investment and you're already starting at zero or probably negative zero neg- not negative zero you're already starting below zero for me because you put this match on Smackdown with no build no anything you know the John Cena United States Challenge was great because he was John freaking Cena and all these new guys coming up to face him and it led for a lot of great feuds and yada 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 it was great we don't need every champion ever to do this, you know. Uh, Big E needs to be put over, not putting over other guys, you know. And that's what John Cena was really there. He helped other guys win in a loss. Prime example, Sami Zayn, Kevin Owens, you know. But not every champion needs to do this. Okay, I'm, I'm going down a rabbit hole. All right, last but not least, um, I think I mentioned this a little bit too. This whole match to me was hot shotting. Like I said, no selling, no caring about building up the match, no story being told. Like it was just move after move after move after move after move after move after move. Like sell it. Show me that you just got hurt. Show me that you care about this match. Show me that this isn't just a freaking whatever scripted wrestling show. Give me some reason to have any kind of emotional investment. You don't just need to hit each other hard and do high spot after high spot after high spot. And a high spot doesn't always have to be this, like, high-flying move, right? Just, like, big moves. Slow down. Slow down. I don't know if the problem was they didn't get enough time for this match. Probably, clearly, considering they didn't even get to enter. But, um, or at least enter on television. But slow down. Do a headlock, you know? I don't know if it's because they were both faces or I don't know whoever put this whole match together, you get an F from me because you had two of the most talented wrestlers alive right now. And I say that, you know, obviously that's a very subjective opinion, but in my opinion, two extremely talented guys, you know, in between the ropes, at least athleticism wise, right? Again, I have my own opinions on Apollo Crews and, and, and his ability to do anything else besides the athletic stuff in the ring, but put together a match that I can have some kind of, you know, emotional investment in, some kind of story being told. I just, this this was a low for the week, guys. This was not, this was not for me. Um, curious to hear your guys' thoughts. Maybe you didn't dive as deep on this, and maybe you like the high spot after high spot and no slow match, but, you know, maybe I'm a patient wrestling fan. I, I don't know. Um, but I'd rather you slow it down, tell a story, build up to the big moves so they actually mean something, and, I don't know, maybe sell them. Um... Uh, so that's all. I'm, I'm done. I'm done ranting about this. I'm going to move on to the high for the week because, like I said, there was a lot to talk about and a lot of amazing wrestling this week. So let's let's talk about it. So yeah, so, you know, my personal high for the week, I don't know if you guys noticed, but I um, got a new microphone. Uh, I listened uh, back to specifically the show on Sunday and just the sound quality I was dreadful. So I apologize for that. Um, but I got a new microphone. Hopefully this sounds a little bit better. Hopefully it's a little bit crisper. Um and I wanted to throw that out there because I'm excited about it. There's nothing like some new toy to, to get you excited about whatever you're doing. So the real high of the week, and we're talking about uh, some stuff going on in wrestling, there was a bunch of stuff that I loved. Um, there was some amazing matches on AEW Dynamite, um, you know, uh, the championship match, both the um, TNT championship match with Darby Allin uh, and uh, the AEW world championship match, Kenny Omega. I think whatever they're doing on AEW is working, um, especially for the demographic they're trying to reach. It is, I think, like I think I've said this before on the show, they've got this, 
you know, pandemic era wrestling thing down to a science where WWE, I think, is still trying to figure it out, you know, and we're almost almost a year in, a little less than that. So just wanted to throw that out there, that that um, great show, you know, I don't talk a lot about AEW and going specifics. I'm just, I'm not, I'm not as invested and I would love to become more invested in AEW and that's why this show is a little bit more exciting for me. You know, I'm invested in a lot of wrestlers on AEW. Actually, Cody Rhodes used to be like my favorite wrestler of all time um, and uh, and Matt Seidel. I used to be a big Evan Bourne fan, believe it or not, when... um. When there was ECW and WWE's version of ECW, that god-awful attempt at ECW. Um, Evan Bourne, who's now obviously Matt Seidel in the indies and on AEW, had a great match with Cody Rhodes. Cody Rhodes always puts on an amazing match. So there was a lot great going on on AEW, and I just wanted to get, give that an honorable mention and, and you know let you guys know that obviously you know I hear about it, I see it. Great stuff. Um, SmackDown, there was a lot great going on with Roman Reigns. Um, NXT had its ups and downs. Raw had its downs besides that wonderful championship match between, um, uh, oh my gosh, between Keith Lee and Drew McIntyre. Again, it's it's late tonight, I guess, guys. But um, it's not even that late. I guess I'm just getting old. Uh, wonderful championship match between Keith Lee and Drew McIntyre. So there were some highs for the week amongst a lot of, you know, low spots and, and, and particularly some of these WWE shows. But my official high for the week is going out to none other than the NXT women, um, and that was Rhea Ripley versus Raquel Gonzalez in the last woman standing match on NXT New Year's Evil. I mean, wow. Uh, I think the best way to talk about this match is that last women standing or last man standing matches are hard to keep entertaining. Here's your example. Edge versus Randy Orton. A story that was super... Um, that was you were able to sink your teeth into, you know, a really good story behind that match, but it was, it was long, and got hard to watch um, and boring. And so, this the reason I guess that I would I would say that this match was better than that one by a long shot. But the reason why this these two women did such a good job in this match is because if you're gonna go backstage and you're gonna go you know out of the ring, even if you're gonna go in the uh, amongst the fans and stuff like that, the key is to have purpose to have purpose with your movements um and that's what these two women did you know with every place that they it wasn't like they were just punching you know punching each other quote unquote to get to each certain spot to do the spot at this spot and then move to a you know move from a to b to c to d and not do anything in between like they made each you know uh what do we want to call it like transportation or whatever they made each uh transition that's the word i'm looking for they made each transition from spot a to spot b mean something so i didn't even notice that they were transitioning from spot a to b i just thought the whole thing went beautifully together um some highs from that match the uh i i think i said last week or two weeks ago something like that i'm not a big fan of handcuffs in wwe i think it's weird i don't know it's just not for me um when they bring out the handcuffs um, I guess obviously people seem to like it or there's a reason behind it, but for me, subjectively, not for me, but what they did on this match with Raquel Gonzalez ripping that fence was awesome. You know, I will remember that spot for a while. I thought that was incredible. And not only does she do that, but then she says, huh, like, let me hit Rhea Ripley with this. You know, you think about that fence has got to be jagged, whatever. I bought into that, and I and I loved that spot, and I loved the spot. Um, these women were hitting each other hard. Kendo sticks, oh, that poor spot where Rhea Ripley hits her back on the edge of the table and it still crumbles. Oh, my gosh. Um, favorite spot, without a doubt, was uh, Dakota Kai coming in and Rhea, Rippling her, Rhea, Rippling, Rhea Ripley putting her in the locker and then putting the thing up in front of her uh, so she couldn't get out. Again, intention in each little transition in this match it was beautifully done I had my eyes you know glued to the screen I wasn't like skipping through you know the little skip button skipping through uh to get to each actual spot like this whole match was beautifully put together and these two women hit each other hard these women are big women giant muscular women and they were booked in a match that allowed them to use that and use that as a strength obviously because it is right and these two women have great chemistry. And so I think Raquel Gonzalez is is it, you know. I, I think she is the next NXT Women's Champion. I think, you know, Io Shirai, you know, hopefully, I don't, I don't want to even say come to the main roster because I know that she would probably get as screwed up as Asuka is getting right now. But 
Um, I want Raquel Gonzalez as our next NXT Women's Champion. You know, as next as next take as soon as next takeover. You know, uh, she's got a great, great look about her, great intensity, and uh, and then she's got Dakota Kai too, right? And there's a bunch of cool stories you can go uh, go off with that. So that was an incredible match. A couple other spots I really liked. Um, the spot where Rhea Ripley jumped off uh, onto uh, Gonzalez on the table back there. The only thing I didn't love about that was I felt like I felt like that should have been sold a little bit longer. But I, again, I'm nitpicking. Um, I just I know these two women are big and strong, and whatever. But I don't know. You just got put through a table from a high distance. Like maybe they they miscalculated the timing of whatever they were doing in between. But that should have been sold a little bit longer. And then the part where they go through the stage, you know, Rhea Ripley, uh, I mean, excuse me, Raquel Gonzalez puts Rhea Ripley through the stage. And then Raquel Gonzalez slowly climbs out and just barely makes it for the count of 10. Like, that is how you book a last woman standing match, last man standing match, last freaking toaster standing match. I don't care. That is how you do it. And so, you know, for the next match they do, next last man standing match, you know, use this as a template. Obviously, not every match has to be exactly like this, but this was a great template for how a, a, a last man standing match should, could stay entertaining and have big spots and be intense and hard hitting but tell a story you know the trash talking going in between especially for Michael Gonzalez was great again I was I was entertained and I was into the storyline and I was into the match and it was all simply from the great work from these two women to make it feel like it was it was real what was going on on my tv was something really going on these two women truly hate each other like I believe that um and so yeah so that's my high for the week guys um I'm not forgetting this week I solidly remembered and I am going to give you uh your random match recommendation but like always I'd love to hear what you guys have to think your higher lower the week um you know how to get in contact with us email Matt or myself or whatever email the, the whole the whole squad at um real WWE podcast at gmail.com he will always relay the message um, I'd love to hear what you guys have to say, and I'd love to hear your highs and lows for the week, because there were a lot of other amazing highs that I'm sure you guys would pick, um, especially that main event on NXT 2 was incredible, I don't know why, I just, for some reason, I just wasn't that into it, but as a true, pure wrestler's match, if you look at that, that was incredible, um, so yeah, so that's my high for the week, and then I'm going to get into my random match recommendation this week, which is none other than... Brock Lesnar versus Eddie Guerrero, No Way Out, 2004. Yeah, this, I mean, this match speaks for itself. I'm sure, you know, especially if you're a longtime WWE fan, you've heard of this. I was actually only six when this match happened, so I did not watch it live. Um, but I, uh, I've i gone back and watched this, and, um, and wow, I mean, uh, the story. Eddie Guerrero was like the original Daniel Bryan story, um, except with, in my opinion, way more layers and, and real layers, not scripted layers. Again, the Daniel Bryan had a lot of real layers to it, but I just mean Eddie Guerrero's story in general. The whole thing was done so beautifully, and the match was done so beautifully. Obviously, that was that's, there was this slight, um, you know what? I'm, I'm not even going to tell you. I'm going to tell you guys to go watch it if you haven't seen it. Um, if you have seen it, go watch it again because it deserves an, it deserves your view anytime. Um, incredible match. These two men put on a show beautiful story told outside of the ring and then in the ring while they were in the match build up it was a long match but it was worth it so highly recommend and that is my random match recommendation for the week for you guys and with that that was your highs and lows uh on the unofficial wwe podcast this week like i said i'd love to hear what you guys think Uh, i thought this was a great week in wrestling you know, fingers crossed that Raw and the rest of WWE figures itself out. It seems like NXT's on the right track. SmackDown's sort of figuring it out, or at least they have Roman Reigns. Uh, Raw's got Drew McIntyre and some other great stars. And, oh, Raw's got AJ Styles and uh, and uh, Amos. Omos? Amos. I think they said Amos this week. Uh, so... I, I can't be that hard. So hopefully they figure it out and uh, and put something better. It would be hard to put something on worse than they did last week. Though, if you guys didn't see, real quick, the ratings for Raw were through the roof. So essentially we're probably screwed with that. But like I said, that's it for this week. Um, thanks, uh, thanks for listening, and I will talk to you guys well, next week. <laughs>